Okay, so as I'm doing this video, uh, Congress is in session and they are debating whether the U.S. should intervene in Syria, whether the Congress should support a resolution that allows the president to start, you know, engaging in the Syrian conflict. There's some debate about whether troops on the ground or just bombing. Uh, and there's significant opposition to in Congress, but, but I suspect We'll find out next week. I suspect that Congress will pass this. So how did we get to this position and why, why are we in this position? What, what's going on in Syria? So the Syrian conflict started about two years ago and it started kind of the way many of the conflicts in the, around the Arab Spring started with demonstrations in, uh, city, in towns and cities around uh, Syria and, and then in Damascus uh, demanding more political freedom. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is, is a is the son is a second generation uh, brutal dictator uh, in Syria. So, uh, you know, the people were up, uh, there was an uprising just like we saw in other places around the Middle East. Assad, of course, uh, came out uh, strong, you know, uh, shot a lot of the demonstrators, and, and that was the beginning of, uh, of a civil war in Syria. And what we're seeing today is a full fledged civil war in Syria. Uh, in the beginning, uh, many of the demonstrators were what you would call pro-Western liberals, but I think that's still a, a minority within the opposition forces in Syria, although it might be a significant minority, it's still a minority. The dominant opposition force in Syria, just like the dominant opposition force in almost any other uh, Arab country today, uh, Egypt uh, being the prime example of this, are the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood has been a political force in Syria for decades. Uh, there was an uprising in the early 80s that was, uh, that was put down by, uh, by Assad's father, uh, where he killed tens of thousands of people in an uprising uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the dominant element within the opposition are Muslim Brotherhood, and then there are more radical elements than even the Muslim Brotherhood. There were Al-Qaeda elements, militant Islamists. So the Muslim Brotherhood are bad enough. They're Islamists, but they, they, they tend to be relatively speaking, in at least the short term, milder than the more radical Al-Qaeda-driven uh, elements that, that are much more aggressive and much more militant in terms of uh, the use of violence. So we have the civil war uh, raging between a dictatorial uh, regime, a dictatorial regime aligned with Hezbollah, which is uh, the Shiite uh, who dominates kind of Lebanese politics today, uh, militant element, uh, terrorist element with, uh, that, that, that have been militarized, they've got weapons, they, they've engaged with warfare with Israel. And both of those parties are aligned with the Iranians. The Iranians are the primary backers of, uh, of Syria. Uh, they provide them with the money with which the Syrians can then go purchase uh, Russians, Russian weapons. So that's kind of the Syrian side. We've got them fighting, uh, the regime side fighting against these uh, these different uh, disparate groups of opposition forces, again, dominated by Islamists. Right now, the civil war is kind of at a stalemate. Uh, they seem to be, the regime seems to gain some territory, and then the opposition gains some territory, and it's kind of back and forth. Uh, the, the, the opposition uh, controls certain parts of the country, particularly in the northern part of Syria, uh, and the regime controls, uh, still controls uh, most of the country. Uh, a few uh, weeks ago, there's significant evidence to suggest that the regime used chemical weapons against its own people. I've heard estimates about 1,400 civilians died uh, as, part of, as, as a consequence of the use of these chemical weapons. But if you remember a few months ago, there have been ongoing reports, particularly out of Israeli intelligence, suggesting that chemical weapons have been used on several occasions over uh, the past few uh, months by the regime against the opposition forces uh, uh, killing civilians. Put aside the chemical weapons, this civil war has killed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Syrians. Many, many of them civilians, women and children. Uh, both parties are responsible for massive killing of civilians. So why is this debated now? This civil war has been going on for two years. Why has suddenly this issue come about? Well, because the Syrian regime has used chemical weapons. So what we're being told, in a sense, America will not step in, does not intervene, does not need to do anything. If you're just slaughtering people using bullets and, and bombs and, and other so-called conventional weapons, but if you use chemical weapons, now that's bad. 
Why is it bad? Nobody can really give you a reason. A red line has been crossed. What red line? We'll, we'll get to Obama's red line in a minute. But what red line? You're still killing civilians. You're just killing indiscriminately. What red line? More importantly, what American interest is at stake here? What American interest is, is, is differentiated between the use of chemical weapons versus conventional weapons? Where does conventional weapons not involve American interests and chemical weapons does involve American interest? Look, at the end of the day, this is basically an appeal to emotion. That's all it is. This is an emotional response. Uh, dying and using chemical weapons is horrific. Uh, you know, if you've seen video of how people die of chemical weapons, I was in Israeli, in the Israeli army in the late 70s, early 80s. Syria had chemical weapons back then. We trained for use of chemical weapons. We watch videos. It's one of the most brutal ways to die. But you're still dead. It's emotionally... Uh, you know, wrenching to watch somebody die of chemical weapons and the idea of the use of chemical weapons. But that's what this is. This is foreign policy based on emotions. This is foreign policy based on fear. This has nothing to do with interest. This has nothing to do, even on the humanitarian ground, this has nothing to do with the number of people dying. This is purely emotion driven. This is purely nonsensical. It makes absolutely no sense. So. Uh, what we have here somehow is an appeal to emotion, an emotion-driven foreign, po foreign policy. There's no reason or rationale for the U.S. to get involved now that didn't exist a month ago, a year ago, and so on. Now they say, wait a minute, but there's a red line. Obama drew a red line. American credibility is at stake because an American president went out there and said, I will not tolerate the use of chemical weapons. If chemical weapons are used, America shall intervene. And yes, there is a red line. And yes, American credibility is at stake. But it's a stupid red line. It's a ridiculous red line. It's a red line that should never exist. What Congress should announce and what your president, if we had a half decent president, would say is, look, I made a mistake. It was a bad red line. No American interest is affected by this red line. This is a red line that has nothing to do with American self-defense has nothing to do with the protection of lives and property of Americans. This is a arbitrary red line, an emotional red line, an altruistic, self-sacrificial red line, and therefore I withdraw it. But be warned, if you cross the red line, and the red line is if you threaten the lives of Americans, if you threaten the real interests of Americans, then we will really come after you. That's the only red line that should exist. And that's a real red line. And that, by the way, is the one red line that people violate all the time and we do nothing about. So the Iranians are, are building nuclear weapons. They said they want to use it against us. They've uh, killed Americans repeatedly through, for the last, really since 1979, the 1980s, and the 1990s, uh, in the 2000s. They, 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 uh, they fund terrorism all over the world. They actively engage in warfare with the United States. They're developing nukes. We keep putting in red lines saying, don't buy centrifuges, don't do this, don't do that. They ignore every single one of the red lines that we put in front of them. And we ignore the fact that they ignore the red lines. We put on lame economic sanctions and we do nothing, absolutely nothing. Why? Because it's in our self-interest. Why are we getting so upset about Syria? because we have no self-interest there. Notice how foreign policy works and what gets people excited. What gets people excited is humanitarian, self-sacrificial, altruistic U.S. intervention. When it's truly in our self-interest, when true American interests are at stake, when the protection of American lives is involved, uh, you know, then we need to negotiate, we need to compromise, we need to sanctions, we need to do a thousand different things but no military action. Foreign policy in the United States is driven by altruism. It's driven, it's not even a, 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 any kind of a consistent form of altruism. It's a pragmatic form of altruism. But what is, what is the defining characteristic of it is selflessness. It's not in our self-interest. It's a foreign policy that's driven, explained, justified, you know, without any reference to American self-interest purposefully or without any reference to true American self-interest purposefully. Uh, they couch it in, in, in vague self-interest like American credibility at stake. 
No, American credibility was a stake when we drew a, red, a stupid red line, when we drew a red line that had nothing to do with our self-interest. That's when everybody laughed at us. It's a stupid red line, what are you putting it there? And American credibility is a stake when we, when we ignore the red lines that we place in front of Iran. And of course, you know, we, ignored all the red, we ignored all the violations of the red line we placed in front of uh, North Korea over and over and over again. So our credibility shot anyway. We have no credibility uh, today. So we've got a pragmatic, uh, you know, emotion-driven, selfless kind of foreign policy that is driving this. Uh, so another reason people give uh, to go after Syria. Syria is an ally of Iran. If we weaken Syria, we weaken the Iranians, and the Iranians are the real enemy. This is the most cowardly, stupid reason I've ever heard. Right? It's pure cowardice. If Iran is the real enemy, what are you doing with Syria? Go after Iran. It's not like we can't go after Iran. It's not like Iran has some mighty military force like the Soviet Union that we couldn't touch because they would lob missiles at America. If we wanted to destroy the Iranian nuclear capability, if we wanted to destroy the regime in Iran, we could do it. And indeed, I believe, I believe that our self-interest dictates that we should do it. But what do we need a proxy war? This is, this is just ridiculous and again, kind of an emotional, stupid, uh, unprincipled uh, excuse kind of to try to couch this in terms of self-interest so that you sell it to the American people. Okay. So, you know, another really, really bad reason uh, for going to war in Syria. Uh, another one that Republicans uh, seem to be talking about a lot in the hearings is notice that Republicans do not say, are not saying, or, or, or at least this is not their main argument, there's no American interest at stake, we shouldn't be going. That's it, finished. There's, you don't have to argue any more than that. Uh, from what I've seen in the hearings, and this is Rand Paul and, and, and a number of other congressmen, it's about, well, we don't know if this will work and who we're helping and who we're not helping and, and you know, this will probably fail. That's not a reason. If we want it to work, we can make it work. We can, you know, we can bomb Syria into oblivion if we really wanted to do that. It's not an issue of will it work or won't work. It's the issue of principle. This is not an American self-interest. But on top of that, it is true. This aspect of it is true. What Obama wants to do won't work <laughs> under any parameters because he's already said, look, we just want to prick them a little bit. We just want to send a shot across the bow. We don't really mean to you know, uh, uh, really disrupt anything. We're not taking sides in the Civil War. We, we, and, and this is the whole point. We have no interests here. We, we just want to make it clear to Bashar al-Assad that he shouldn't use chemical weapons. But look, Assad's already moved all his important military assets into population centers. Do you think America is going to bomb population centers? No way. So they're going to send a few missiles into insignificant places. They're going to destroy maybe the air defense system. Who, I mean, the only, who's worried about the air defense system in Syria? I mean, they don't need them to fight the opposition forces because the opposition forces have no airplanes. So yeah, it'll make it easier later on if Israel or the United States wants to bomb Syria. But, what, but the whole point is we're not going to, right? We're just going to send a message. So it's going to be an insignificant message. Nobody's going to read the message. It's, it's going to send a message of weakness. So even what they're going to do is pathetic and meaningless. Now, again, they shouldn't do anything. But what they're going to do is, not, is going to decrease American credibility because it's going to show how much of a paper tiger we are and how pathetic we are because we're not going to do anything substantial to reduce the capability of Bashar al-Assad to engage in war. In spite of all the experts on television telling you otherwise, nothing will actually be done. Uh, and the fact that uh, Obama has given, him, given Assad weeks in order to hide his stuff and put it in population centers and so on, is more of an, you know, more suggestive that, you know, nothing actually uh, will happen. Uh, so look, foreign policy should be guided by, you know, military action should be guided by one thing, and that is American interests. We should never engage in military action unless the lives of Americans uh, are at risk. We should, unless there's a real threat to Americans to the rights of Americans, 
we should not be engaged in military policy. Our whole foreign policy should be guided by the principle of protecting individual rights. No American rights are being threatened by Syria. Look, this is not out of a love of Bashar al-Assad, you know. It's not out of a love of, of the Syrian regime that I oppose this. I, I, I hate them thoroughly. They have no, it's not out of a respect for their um, sovereignty that I oppose military action. I have no respect for their sovereignty. Uh, they're a dictatorship. Dictatorships have no sovereignty. This is purely from the perspective of American self-interest. America has no self-interest in attacking Assad, and particularly in attacking Assad the way they're going to attack. America should refocus its foreign policy on what's truly in our self-interest, draw red lines around the lives, the true interests of, the, of, of Americans. Uh, American government needs to return to its proper role protecting the individual rights of American citizens.